So my name is Jengis Neaver. I'm one of the uh, orthopedic hand surgeons at Summit Medical Group in uh, Florham Park. Uh, the address that's actually listed in the program is incorrect. That's the Berkeley Heights main headquarters. I'm not there, never. And uh, if I've seen your patients, uh, thank you very much for trusting me with them. I'm gonna try to make it brief because the weather outside is really, really nice. And I'm sorry to tell you guys that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about hand dislocations and instability, just common things that I see. Um, what I'm going to cover are some of the dislocations, tendon injuries, and thumb injuries, how to acutely treat it from your perspective, and then definitive management from my perspective. A uh, quick background of me, I grew up in Westfield, uh, close by, so I still see family and friends and teachers and parents and all that stuff. Uh, I went to undergrad at Berkeley, med school in Newark, uh, residency at UConn, and I did a hand surgery fellowship at Rothman in Philly at Jefferson. Uh, so this is my office in Florham Park. Uh, I'm there every single day of the week. Um, why is this important for me? Uh, I cover the New Jersey Devils, so I treat athletes of the elite variety. Uh, I don't treat them any differently than most patients of mine. Uh, this is me on national TV in Montreal. My cousin sent it to me. Um, but I get to see a lot of these instabilities, dislocations on a frequent basis, on an emergent basis in a way uh, that I have to treat sometimes on the ice or in the locker room. So what do I end up seeing? I see finger dislocations a lot. I see mallet fingers all the time. Jersey fingers occasionally in a gamekeeper thumb or a thumb injury for the ulnar collateral ligament of the MP joint. Very, very frequent, especially in the winter months. So let's just talk briefly about collateral ligament injuries of the finger. Uh, people always worry about instability of the uh, PIP or DIP joints. Uh, this occurs from a jamming type of injury. It's usually non-operative except for the radial collateral ligament of the index finger at the PIP joint. Clearly you need something to pinch and grip against. And so if you're pinching and you don't have a ligament that's intact and the Finger starts to swing open like a barn door. Occasionally does need to be fixed, but literally 95% of ligament injuries of the finger are non-operative. Uh, volar plate injuries, very, very common. This is a jamming injury. Basketball hits a finger. The undersides of the interphalangeal joints have a ligament called the volar plate preventing hyperextension. That ligament almost always tears, does not need surgery. However, the joints are very prone to stiffness. They require immediate therapy, immediate motion, and I try to avoid splinting. Uh, ERs tend to splint patients to obviously get them comfortable, get them out of there. They come back to me two to three weeks later, still in the splint. The worst was six weeks of a splint, and that PIP joint did not move. So those patients end up needing immediate therapy. So whenever I get to see our urgent care or ER send to me, and I see the patient within a day or two, I actually get rid of the splint. I tell them to start moving, and I reassess them about a month later. Occasionally, some of them are operative. Uh, certain avulsions of those, if they're large enough of a fragment, do require surgical intervention. And that's really the kind that are on the underside or the volar part of the PIP joint. Uh, those are sometimes so large that the joint becomes unstable. It starts to dislocate or subluxate, and those oftentimes require surgery. And then occasionally, you get the failed close reduction. Uh, just doesn't uh, reduce well of a dislocation or uh, instability of that joint. That needs to be fixed. So this is a volar lip injury, and this is interesting because of the amount of injury to the volar side of the joint. This kind of just drives down, shears out, and then essentially this sometimes needs surgical intervention. Uh, the management's really tricky, um, especially for these finger dislocations. Growth plates make a big difference, and uh, my practice philosophy uh, compared to my meathead partners who are sports medicine guys who are getting little kids moving really quick and whatnot, um, their growth plates are still open, and so therefore, if they're tender over the growth plate, by definition, it's a Salter Harris 1 fracture. I splint kids. I splint them for three weeks. Uh, typically, that relieves their pain. They never get stiff. They never need hand therapy. Parents hate me because their kid can't play in the lacrosse showcase in sixth grade for their college scholarship and all this stuff, but I absolutely try my best to treat the kid right so that their finger's better, they're not in a revolving door situation coming back to see me six weeks later that it's still painful, that it was inadequately treated. I treat it definitively with a splint for three weeks and then motion afterwards. So that's a detailed discussion. Definitely not in this setting, but we can always debate about if you have questions, you can always talk to me. Uh, just a reminder of the growth plate, um, and that's pretty much the Salter Harris one is just uh, no fracture seen on an x-ray, but tenderness over a growth plate different management than the adult with immediate motion. What types are there? Dislocation-wise, there's dorsal dislocations, volar dislocations, lateral dislocations. Uh, the initial treatment is to close, reduce, and splint. 
uh, local anesthetic digital block, pull on the finger, it's kind of the simplest way I can describe it, and try to put it back in. Uh, sometimes I even can't get it in because there are interposed soft tissues that get in the way, and it sometimes does require operative intervention with an open uh, reduction. The things that make it irreducible, this is pretty much an uh, orthopedic uh, board's question for residents. Uh, when it's a dorsal dislocation and the middle phalanx is out dorsally, uh, the volar plate gets in the way. When it's a volar dislocation, the central slip or the extensor tendon over the PIP joint gets in the way. And if it's a lateral dislocation, the lateral bands get in the way. Complications from dislocations. PIP flexion contractors are super, super common. Um, I tend to follow these patients back even though it's a simple finger dislocation and people can poo-poo it and say it's a small thing and the sports meathead partners of mine say, oh, you know, just get them moving and play them, put them back in lacrosse. Well, they end up getting some flexion deformities and a contracture, which is a pseudo boutonniere. Uh, I don't want to go into the intricacies of that. Uh, swan neck deformities occur if the volar plate is actually ruptured and doesn't heal. And then extensor lags occur where the fingers don't come up fully straight. And that's something that needs to be addressed with therapy very rarely surgery in the future. Uh, this is something that I just wanted to briefly touch upon. What a swan neck, uh, what a boutonniere deformity is, is essentially when um, certain tendons, you get an imbalance of the tendons, and then the finger starts to get flexion at the PIP and hyperextension at the DIP, uh, usually non-operative for most. Jersey finger, um, avulsion of the FDP tendon. Uh, Mike Baskies went over the anatomy of the, the finger tendons. Uh, the flexor digitorum profundus tendon gets pulled off of its, its insertion site off the distal phalanx. It's typically when a finger is caught against a jersey or some sort of uh, resistance, and it's typically the ring finger in 75% of patients. Uh, what's it look like? Essentially flexion of the other fingers, and the, the finger is affected, uh, can't flex, and it stays straight. Uh, so it's a clinical exam, uh, and on the exam, there's tenderness of the distal phalanx, the fingers in extension, you can't get flexion of the DIP joint, and then occasionally patients will complain of tenderness of the, of the palm at the level of the A1 pulley where the trigger fingers are, and that's because the FDP tendon has pulled all the way back to that area. So if I ever do surgery, I sometimes have to extend the incision from not only the distal phalanx, but go all the way down into the palm and rarely into the carpal tunnel, which is where you can also find the tendon. Treatment options, big debate. Uh, it's something that I actually used to ask my fellowship director and fellowship, if this happens to you, what do you want done? And he and I both were saying, I would not get it fixed. Uh, it's a giant surgery. You're in a splint for six weeks that goes above your hand, and you're in flexion for all four fingers. Uh, and all the fingers get stiff just so you can flex the tip of one of them. Big deal. Leave me alone. Let me use my hand. Don't fix me. And if I have any issues in the future, you can always do salvage procedures like a fusion of the DIP joint to get power. Um, people tend to flex your tendon graft. My partners who are older than I, they tend to do all these two-stage reconstructions. I try to talk patients out of surgery for this, unless they're really young or if it's very acute, because it's a pretty annoying uh, recovery for the patient. Not hard for me to do, just annoying, but the patient also is disgusted by the fact that they have sutures sticking out of their fingernail with a button on the top that's holding the sutures together. It's really weird, and uh, it's something that looks like that. And so people get alarmed, and uh, it does work. It's a great procedure, but people are stiff. They need therapy. And that button stays in for six weeks, by the way. Gamekeeper's thumb. Uh, it's a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb MP joint, the inner part of the thumb, from a direct fall or a hard grasp of something. Um, and that's something that the, the sad part is, I, you know, you're always taught that it's actually from, the, the name came from killing game like uh, um, chickens or whatnot, but it's actually from forcefully killing a rabbit by putting your hand into its spinal cord. And that's how they'd get these gamekeeper thumbs in the past. Uh, and now it's nicely called the skier's thumb. That's what I call it. So I don't scare people away. Um, and they can have a stenor lesion, which is something that I'll discuss. Um, that's essentially when the ligament comes out, and it's supposed to insert over here, this torn ligament, but this is the adductor aponeurosis. It's, it's a part of a, a muscle kind of a tendon, and the ligament goes on the inside and can't reattach underneath, and it sticks on the outside. So what you end up seeing is uh, a patient has an amount of swelling on the inner part of the thumb. Uh, they have complete instability on exam. Uh, I get an MRI only to prove to the patient they have a stenor lesion. 
Uh, patients always want to have the final workup. I say to them, you know what, I'll get an MRI, I'll show you that there's a stenter lesion, and then once the radiologist calls it, I show it to them, and then they understand that it needs surgery. Because this will never heal without surgery, because that ligament can't come back underneath this and reattach to the bone. What's that look like? This is my picture from my surgery. A giant ball. Here is the adductor aponeurosis. This is on the outside. It's supposed to be underneath this part. And clearly it's on the outside. That will never be reattached. What do you see? You see mass on the palpation. Instability when the, fingers, uh, uh, the thumb is in 30 degrees of flexion. So what you do is you flex the thumb at 30 degrees. Uh, if the patient doesn't want to punch you uh, because of the amount of pain that they're going to experience, you kind of gently try to push the thumb proximal phalanx out. And if you have instability there compared to the contralateral side, uh, that's diagnostic for tear. Uh, you have to compare to the other side, but obviously patients, when they're very painful, they're going to guard. They're not going to do it the right way. And it's really uh, an exam kind of thing. Hand surgeons, we debate, do we get an MRI, do we not? I only get one if a patient... Uh, really doesn't believe me, or if I want to see that there's a stenter lesion and prove that to the patient. Otherwise, I don't need an MRI for them. And the MRI does show it. X-rays, I get an X-ray on everybody for this, uh, because occasionally you have an avulsion of the actual proximal phalanx base, and that's indicative of a full thickness tear. Treatment options, observation, older patients, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, don't really have high demand sometimes, I'll just leave them alone. Uh, Non-operatively, it's treated with a custom splint for uh, six weeks. It takes, I tell the patient, biologically six weeks for the ligament to heal to bone. Nothing I can do to speed that up. So they understand that. I do six weeks of splinting and then therapy. Uh, repair of it is a simple procedure. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of its options, but it's about a 15-minute, 20-minute surgery under my hands. Uh, I get people moving two weeks afterwards, which is great. Uh, even the elite athletes as well. Surgical reconstruction, if it's anything beyond six weeks is what the definition says by the book. Uh, anything after three months is really reconstructed using a, a tendon source from somewhere else. And then ultimately, salvage procedures. If arthritis is in that joint, we can fuse the joint. A uh, former partner of mine, uh, he would fuse everybody over 50. I think that's a little aggressive. Uh, most 50-year-olds don't necessarily have arthritis in that joint. They don't need a fusion. But if any of these fail, we can always fuse it, and people have an excellent function with a thumb uh, MP joint fusion. Finally, what's next? Uh, questions from you guys. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Easy ways to reach me, you can email me. I answer text messages pretty frequently. My wife hates it, but I just want to be available to my friends and colleagues. And if you want to reach my office, uh, I'm always happy to see any patients of yours. But uh, any questions that I can answer from the things I discussed? There's got to be one. All right, everybody wants to go into 80 degree weather right now. So thank you very much. So we're going to do, um, we're going to do uh, one thing right now. We're going to do the breakout session here. Um, and so basically we're going to do some case discussions. Uh, I prepared a few. All the other hand colleagues of mine prepared a few. And we'd be just happy to go over um, kind of the workup and what to do. And from your perspective, anything that you guys might have questions on. So is it coming up? Are the... IT. Any questions while we wait? If you guys want, I could just talk off the cuff on mallet fingers while we wait, uh, and that's that similar thing to an FDP avulsion, the jersey finger, but it's the extensor tendon from the distal phalanx that gets avulsed off. Uh, I see about four patients, five patients a week with a mallet finger. Uh, the atraumatic kinds are the ones where a patient is pulling a bed sheet, uh, pulling a drawer, pulling pants up. I had a professional snowboarder pulling his pants up, and he says, oh, my finger doesn't really, uh, it's drooping, you know? And so those, when you get an x-ray, don't have any bony involvement. Those don't require surgery in 95% of people if they acutely present. 
uh, and the treatment for that is a custom splint that a therapist makes for the DIP joint only for six continuous weeks. If you take the splint off and it droops again, I tell patients restart the six week clock all over again. So the therapists are the ones who educate the patient on how to remove it for hygiene. Uh, and then we transition them for, I see them back at the six week point. I transi transition them to a nighttime splint for four more weeks. And at the end of the 10 weeks, if they're stiff, we do therapy. If a bony fragment is involved, the absolute indication is if there's volar subluxation of the distal phalanx. So if the distal phalanx on the, the lateral view x-ray slides down in relation to the middle phalanx, that needs to be fixed surgically. And that's to uh, have normal function of the finger, not uh, getting early arthritis. A relative indication is if 50% of the joints involved with that fracture fragment. And I still try to treat those non-operatively in most people. Uh, surgery for that um, is under local anesthesia. Uh, what Dr. Zaino was mentioning about wide awake surgery, I do 80% of my surgeries awake. Uh, and so that's something that uh, us younger guys tend to do. The older guys still put people to sleep for most surgeries. Uh, I do a mallet surgery awake, which is about a 20, 30 minute procedure with pins inserted. Uh, the pins stay in for six weeks. They get a custom splint to protect the pins and then the pins get removed in the office. Uh, and functionally, they get great outcomes. Mallet fingers do very well. Our studies tell us that up to 20% of uh, a 20 degree droop is still acceptable to live with non-operatively for life. So.